Jung talks about inflation as one of the problems in the ego's encounter with the self. He writes, the more numerous and the more significant the unconscious contents which are assimilated to the ego, the closer the approximation of the ego to the self, even though this approximation must be a never-ending process. This inevitably produces an inflation of the ego unless a critical line of demarcation is drawn between it and the unconscious figures. But this act of discrimination yields practical results only if it succeeds in fixing reasonable boundaries to the ego and in granting the figures of the unconscious, the self, anima, animus and shadow relative autonomy and reality of a psychic nature. Fixing reasonable boundaries to the ego is an important feature of practical analysis. For instance, it is commonplace to hear such remarks as I made this mistake or I had that reaction, when in fact these events are products of the unconscious. A young interviewer asks Jung why a patient selects a particular symptoms and Jung replies that he doesn't select, they happen to him. You could ask just as well when you are eaten by a crocodile, how you happen to select that crocodile. He has selected you. The ego does not choose its symptoms. It is a victim of the particular symptom that the unconscious throws up. The symptom is like a crocodile that grips and possesses one. This is most important to realize. This is how we fix reasonable boundaries to the ego. We don't grant to the ego power and responsibility that don't properly belong to it. That would be inflation. Inflation is also a very subtle phenomenon. It is a completely unconscious due to the universally held presupposition that there is no such thing as autonomous psyche beyond the ego. Anyone who talks in public about the autonomous psyche is suspected of being a little crazy. Although this state of unconscious inflation is practically universal, one generally does not get into trouble with it. It is astonishing that the vast majority of people can live quite happily in a state of inflation. It is a natural condition unless the individuation process is activated, then one is held to account. Another important symptom of inflation is a growing disinclination to take note of the reactions of environment and pay heed to them. It is good to remember that the unconscious comes to us from the outside as well as the inside, so that the reactions people have to us, the events that happen around us, are all expressions of the unconscious, just as much as a dream is. Jung then goes on to speak of two alternative psychic catastrophes, one in which the ego is assimilated by the self, and the other where the self is assimilated by the ego. Now assimilation is a term for being eaten. Throughout nature, the basic question is who eats whom. If the self eats the ego, at the worst there is an overt psychosis. If the ego eats the self, which seems like an impossible thing to do since the smaller should not be able to swallow the larger, still Jung does speak of such condition. He says, then the self becomes assimilated to the ego, in which case the world of consciousness must now be leveled down in favor of the reality of the unconscious. If the ego devours the self, then we have the rationalistic inflation that is so predominant in which the ego assumes itself to be the totality. In such a case, the antidote must be that the powers of the ego be leveled down in favor of the reality of the unconscious. In the previous situation in which the self assimilates the ego, the contrary is called for. All the conscious virtues, attention, conscientiousness, patience, adaptation must be mobilized to the maximum degree. Jung writes, the real moral problems spring from conflicts of duty. Anyone who is sufficiently humble or easygoing can always reach a decision with the help of some outside authority. But one who trusts others as little as himself can never reach a decision at all unless it is brought about in the manner which common law calls an act of God. In all such cases, there is an unconscious authority which puts an end to the doubt by creating a fate accompli. 
Jung says that such a fate accompli, an action of uncontrollable natural forces, is from a psychological standpoint much better thought of as the will of God than as the result of natural or instinctual forces, because he says, if the inner authority is conceived as the will of God, our self-esteem is benefited because the decision that appears to be an act of obedience and the result, a divine intention. In this way, we prevent the ego from inflation. However, Jung does admit that this point of view can also be used as a convenient way of escaping ego responsibility. But this criticism is justified only when one is knowingly hiding one's own egoistic opinion. This idea of conflict of duty is quite important practically. When one encounters a major conflict of duty, the opportunity arises to discover the reality of the second center of the psyche, to move from stage 2 to stage 3, because in such a conflict one is obliged to choose between two evils. One would like to have a choice simply between what is good and what is bad. But when there is a real conflict of duty, the choice is between two evils, which means one cannot avoid experiencing the opposites. Whatever choice one makes, it is apparent that goodness and badness are being carried simultaneously. An example of such a decision might be whether to have an abortion. Abortion is a crime against nature, and one pays a heavy psychological price for it. On the other hand, it can also be a real crime to bring a child into the world in circumstances that are gravely unsuitable for its well-being. In such a case, the choice is between evils and there is no way of avoiding it. Jung makes the point that the unconscious authority puts an end to such a conflict of duty by creating a fate accompli. All our unconscious unwill action, all our so-called mistakes are such fates accomplished.